Welcome everyone out there. Peter McDobby Jr., Stacy <laughs> Clark, our winemaker. And I think we're going to have a fun hour here. History, storytelling, and some great wines. Great wines. So let me start with history first. Um, Charles Krug, uh, Prussian immigrant, uh, who was uh, well educated uh, in his home, home country of Prussia. But as a journalist, not as a winemaker, he has no winemaking history as of yet. Uh, but he was a radical journalist to the point where he was thrown in jail uh, for a brief revolution uh, there. He got out, immediately made his way to the uh, United States, uh, to California via New York, where he settled in California and uh, continued his writings. He was a, a senior editor for the, the German uh, language newspaper on the West Coast. Stacy was doing some history research and said that uh, he actually got in a duel here in San Francisco and, uh, well, obviously he survived, uh, but he did shoot the finger off the other person. I don't know what else happened to that person. Publisher of a rival newspaper. Yeah, publisher of a rival newspaper. Um, very interesting. Yes, um, so maybe that's an inkling into what Charles Krug is like. Anyway, so he made his way out here to, to San Francisco. Uh, did some other work as well, worked for the U.S. Mint, believe it or not. Uh, he, he became acquainted to some people here who had vineyards, uh, small vineyards for home winemaking. Got involved with that, uh, fell in love with the, the process, prospect of home winemaking. Um, so he pursued that endeavor, actually became a consulting winemaker uh, as well. Uh, some of his initial property was up in Sonoma County. Uh, first, uh, back in the 18, uh, later 1850s. Um, he then married Carolina Bale. The Bale family was a very prominent family, had very significant land tracts uh, throughout uh, North uh, San Francisco Bay Area. So uh, the couple got married in December of 1860. Uh, the couple received a dowry of a little over 500 acres of land right in the heart of Napa Valley. Uh, so in the, on this property, uh, Charles Crude pursued his uh, love of winemaking, uh, established the Charles Crude Winery in 1861, the following year after his, uh, his, their wedding, uh, the very first winery, the oldest winery uh, in Napa Valley. So truly the forefather of the Napa Valley wine industry. Um, he had some people work in the cellar, like we've done for many years, that work in the cellars and move on and start other wineries. Uh, Jacob Berger was there, uh, Jacob Schramm. Uh, so, of course, Jacob Berger went, uh, left there and started his winery with his brother, uh, Berger Brother Winery. Jacob Schramm, Schramm was there as well. And he moved on to start Schramsburg back in the 1800s, just to name a couple of people who uh, worked in the cellars. Uh, so he was quite influential in the Napa Valley wine industry and the California wine industry as well. Because of his uh, political dealings and expertise, he actually traveled and did a lot of lobbying in Sacramento and Washington, D.C. Uh, even though it's the 1800s, the Prohibition movement was uh, quite strong there. So he was quite vocal, obviously, uh, against that. Uh, I think he's actually served as uh, agricultural commissioner for California as well. So uh, very, very engaged, very involved. Um, and actually, you know, 100 years after we had our flock, or 100 years before we had our flocks, or probably in what, 18, or 1985, yeah. or thereabouts. Uh, 1885, thereabouts, uh, we had flocks that uh, the wiped out many of the great vines, and Charles Creek suffered from the same blight. Um, and uh, suffered some financial consequences as well. So he sold off a number of his acres. So he whittled uh, the 500 plus acres he had, whittled down to a little under 150 uh, to, to survive. Um, he passed away in 1892. Uh, his uh, financier, who was kind of bankrolling, I think, uh, to a certain degree, his operations, uh, was a James Moffat. I think there are some people here from the San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, there are two Moffat families uh, that you may be aware of. There's a Moffat Field uh, out in the peninsula near Palo Alto. Uh, not, that, not that Moffat family. There's Moffat Hospital up here in San Francisco itself. It's that uh, 
Moffitt uh, family there, so related to that Moffitt. So uh, they were investors, bankers, uh, so he took possession, took control of the winery in uh, mid-1895. Uh, uh, but you know, being a very astute financial person, he did not continue in the wine business. Uh, he, what he did was he leased out the uh, Charles Group Winery to some locals in St. Helena to continue wine production uh, at the facility. He just got the revenue out there, built some weekend houses, and built two of them. Uh, there, that uh, Dad still lives in uh, one of them. Uh, I lived in the other one for a number of years, but he built it in like 1913, 1914 uh, there. So that's kind of the background of Charles Krug, the Moffat ownership. Let me step away from that and uh, go to my grandparents, uh, Chesare and Rosamond Abbey. Um, <coughs> of course, born in, in Italy, uh, the Marche uh, area. Province of Italy, just uh, kind of southeast of Tuscany. It's uh, you know, within Italy, so it's actually right next to Tuscany. Uh, very modest means. Uh, my grandparents had a partial grade school education, uh, no winemaking in their background whatsoever. Obviously, being Italians, they enjoyed wine. Um, and they got married. My grandmother was 18 years old, grandfather a few years older. Um, Got married in December of, uh, of uh, 1908. Immediately left, jumped on the boat to Ellis Island, and their worldly possessions is you know the clothes they had and about twenty dollars in their pocket, and that was it. And they had the drive and the ambition uh, that so many immigrants had coming over to the United States. So landed in uh, December at Ellis Island and immediately made their way up to uh, Virginia, Minnesota. That's northern Minnesota, the Iron Mine Range, to enjoy the winters up there. Uh, a little bit shocked, probably, when they got there. But the reason they ended up there is they had family and friends that sponsored them uh, to come into the United States. And that's why they uh, ended up there. Uh, my grandfather didn't like laboring in mines. He started a, uh, a saloon there with a, with a partner. Uh, that went okay until uh, Prohibition set in 1920, so we kind of parlayed that into a grocery store business. And there were a number of Italians in this, uh, this part of uh, Minnesota, and uh, the Italians love their homemade wine, or their wine in general, for their everyday beverage. Obviously, you're not buying it during Prohibition. Uh, you're not growing grapevines in northern Minnesota, given the weather up there. So my grandfather really turned into a kind of a serial entrepreneur, very sharp business uh, mind. He started a business of uh, going to California every harvest um, and contracting for grapes, having them packed into uh, wooden boxes, loaded on a rail car, and shipped out to Minnesota. And he would sell these uh, blood boxes, they're 36 pounds of grapes in each, uh, for the locals for home wine uh, production. Uh, Zinfandel was the primary variety. Uh, there is carrying on Alicante uh, as well uh, in those shipments. And he started that, did that for a couple of years, and thought that was the future. Moved the whole family, now four kids, uh, my dad being the youngest. I think he was eight or ten years old uh, uh, on the train when they moved out. Funny little side story. Uh, I guess you know, the kids are playing, running up and down the train, so on and so forth. I don't know where it was. In, partway across the country, and uh, apparently the kids were on one section of the train, and the uh, grandparents were on, or my grandparents were on the other section, section and it went through a city, and uh, the kids were in the section that got detached and went to a different part of the country. Uh, but anyway, they, they, I don't know how, but they actually got hooked up again. Uh, thank God for that. Uh, they made their way to California, and further this business of shipping uh, wine grapes to the whole northeast part of the United States, uh, Chicago, um, all the way over, you know, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Jersey, wherever there were concentrations of immigrants, wine-making immigrants, Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, uh, all those areas. Uh, so a very vibrant business uh, during uh, Prohibition. Very. Uh, interesting statistic, I won't give you the absolute numbers, but obviously wine production and the number of wineries um, diminished during Prohibition, but the number of acres planted uh, grew exponentially because of this uh, shipping of grapes. So it made his way out to California, 
um, uh, that an after repeal got involved in some wineries in Central Valley, and then in 1943 purchased the Charles Krug Winery. And that's how I have my family name associated with the, the Charles Krug brand. My dad and Peter, my uncle Robert, you know, refurbished the wine and reestablished Charles Krug brand name, built it up. Robert split off in 1966. I'm sure you're all aware of that story. Uh, books being written about it. Uh, but shortly after his departure, we purchased uh, Robert's ownership in the Charles Krug winery. So Charles Krug is 100% owned by now dad, my dad, Peter Madavi Sr.'s lineage uh, in the family. And then Robert went off uh, uh, on his, his story, his endeavors. Uh, other things uh, that dad did, uh, very influential to where we are today, uh, he felt, uh, rightfully so, that the, to secure the quality that we're looking for in our wines is he needed a good source for grapes. Best thing to do, buy the property. He bought a series of properties in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, it was not vineyards, these are all properties, agricultural properties, because it's very agriculturally diverse back then in Napa Valley. Uh, pear orchards, uh, dairy land, things like that. Uh, so he amassed, uh, oh, got about a dozen different properties in Napa Valley, um, upwards of 850 acres total. Um, I think he stopped buying land when the price exceeded about $9,000 an acre. So very good investment there. <laughs> and uh, you know, I think that gives uh, a yeah, great foundation for our state driven wines. And, Anyway, she was pass it on to Stacy. Now that we have the foundation laid here, and uh, you know, you've been working with us for a few years, so Stacy's been on board right after the um, eleven harvest, correct? Yes. Or uh, after the ten, before ten. before the eleven harvest. So we have uh, we have elevens here. So three of these are eleven. So uh, yep. it's your first vintage from Great uh, Bottle. Yep. So I'll pass it over to you and. Oh, okay. We'll start with the Sauvignon Blanc. We'll start with Sauvignon Blanc. Um, this is our 2013. This is not yet released. And this is just the, the third vintage. And at the original property, the, the Carolina Vale Bowery, where the winery is located, um, we have um, about 45 acres of Sauvignon Blanc planted. And um, when I came on board in 2011, I had not a lot of experience with Sauvignon Blanc, but I had done some projects with um, Talat Chenin Blanc for a long time, and Peter was gracious enough to uh, let us take a take a shot with uh, with the reserve Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and throughout the blocks that the Sauvignon Blanc is planted on, there's a couple of spots where the gravel's a little more shallow and a little rockier, and then the clusters are tend to be smaller. The berries tend to be a lot smaller. And I can go in and flag those rows and sections of rows, and we'll pick those separately. All of our picking for all of our varieties is at night. And um, even though uh, the vineyard manager is crazy about that, he does it. And um, so it comes in very cold to the winery. Um, and these reserve um, pieces of uh, the vineyard come in for this wine. And it's very small production. This is like 300. And 25 cases. I'd like to get to 500, but mm -hmm. I have to negotiate with the tasting room on that one. Um, but um, we'll put the grapes in a half ton bin and sanitize someone's boots and let them hop in and crush them a little bit so that they get some skin contact in the bin. Um, we let that happen for a couple of hours. We dump them then totally right into the press, press them off, settle, and then they go to some stainless barrels to ferment. And then we also take that opportunity because we've usually got 14 or 16 barrels to um, do some different yeast with the wine. So there's a couple barrels that will go native where we don't add yeast at all. And then we select about three or four other yeasts that are specific for Sauvignon Blanc that actually help release the typical aromas for Sauvignon Blanc. And so it's, there's four, at least four yeasts involved in this. Um, and then as soon as the fermentation is done, you start stirring. So the wine is, is thoroughly aged in stainless barrels. And then we bottle at the end of April. Um, so this wine, I think, will be released in about a month or so. And um, just recently bottled, right? Just recently bottled, like April 29th or something, or April, early April. And um, 
and it's a nice counterpoint to the uh, the San Lena Sauvignon Blanc because the Surly really um, changes the aroma for the quite a bit. It's not as overtly fruity and floral as our cold fermented, uh, tank fermented Sauvignon Blanc um, because the Surly part, the yeasty part, really interacts a lot with the aroma and then it also changes the texture and the mouthfeel a lot. And it's fun to see because you the yeast break down and they do change the, the mouthfeel tremendously, particularly in the back. And I think it's showing really well in with this is as well. We've got two questions. Uh, oh, good. Okay. Yeah, one is um, please describe the choice of bottle that two people ask. That was now is your uh, doing. <laughs> this is Stacy's project, 100% yes. very finished. But it's beautiful, and um, I wanted to. Uh, to Wait, can you repeat the question? Oh, it's, um, it's, it's how did we select the bottle, and it, I, I guess it's maybe semi-non-traditional for a Sauvignon Blanc, but it's just a beautiful bottle. It's sort of that bowling pin shape, and everybody likes to bottle bowling pin shape bottles. Because uh, the bottle difficult to do that. Yeah, because they <laughs> move around a little bit. But it's a very substantial, very attractive bottle, I think, and it's made in France, and and uh, but it just helps set the lines apart and, and yeah. shows the problem. Yeah. Um, that makes um, it distinctive. Distinctive. Uh, the other question was, what do you call the home vineyard on 29? Do you have a That's a very good question. We kind of call it the Thank Charles Krug Ranch. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, just Charles Krug Ranch, but we only formally named it. The other ones we do have formal names too, but this one I think we just, you know, Charles Krug Ranch right now is kind of the default name. Right near, uh, yeah, we don't figure, we just say a state bottled. Question on uh, difference between the regular Sauvignon Blanc, meaning St. Melina Sauvignon Blanc and the limited release, and any plans to expand production on either of them? And please repeat the question. Oh, um, the question was whether we plan to expand this production and also the, the St. Helena um, Sauvignon Blanc production. And actually, uh, the vineyard um, in the last two years has. I maybe I'll plenty, it's not that old, but it's, you know, it's probably seven, eight years old. Yeah, so it's just starting yeah, to it's getting into, into full, reach its, yeah. its mature uh, production levels, and so it's been creeping up on its own, frankly, the last couple of years. And our production has sort of followed that, and um, across the board, like 2000, 2011 was small vintage, very small vintage actually, um, but starting in 2012 and 2013. Um, all the grapes in Napa Valley, they were relatively large vintages back to back, which was sort of surprising. And, and actually, the 2014 looks large as well. So it's sort of taking itself up, and and you're laughing. And um, okay, um, but actually, the uh, the St. Helena production is up to about 22,000 cases now, um, in a very short period of time, and and doing really well. Back. I think one thing we should know is the 2013 is actually a state bottle. This one's a state bottle, but the 2013 Sauvignon Blanc, the main one, is a state True. bottle. True. And this year, uh, we're actually experimenting with cakes, the free flow yes. uh, cakes. Uh, so we have a small production of that. So we'll see what uh, the market thinks about those. Very fresh. What are your go-to dishes with this wine, both of you? Oh, go-to dishes. Um, nothing. I have to ha have it as you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah. The, the patio wine. Um, you know, light, light fish, you know, lighter chicken dishes. Uh, of course, everyone compares it with oysters. Um, I, you know, I don't. I love with a lot of things. I don't get yeah. too hung up on things. Goat cheese is great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, you have any I have it. It's a house wine at my house Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, like, that's our go-to white wine. Uh, I was at uh, the dinner last night at Indianapolis. And this nice uh, tomato compote, which is quite acid actually, uh, fried oysters. And because of the acidity and the tomatoes, it worked out fantastic. And I think, and, and I would think shrimp and, and I mean, there's the, the kind of the obvious Asian, you know, the fruitier Asian dishes. The yeah, Asian dishes. actually Asian would be, be fantastic. A lighter piece of, a brighter flavor, like, you know, and spicy, like jalapeno and that kind of stuff. Like yeah. Too. Yeah, yeah, the spicy stuff, I don't like tannin, tannin wine, so I, so 
expression lines like that, which makes it things. So when they just want to be clear on, as you mentioned, barrels a couple times, okay. and the, they're stainless steel barrels, okay. same size, same shape as a French oak barrel, but this this both sawdust blocks never see a bit of oak. Kind of. And that's a title Yeah. If you want oak, fire chardonnay. Okay. Um, the 2011 Merlot, um, and 2011 was it's a great year to start with, wasn't it? Very <laughs> challenging yet successful year. Um, it's it's not the vintage you really want to have to make your first impression on. Let me tell you that. But um, the Merlot was interesting. It, the whole season was cold, so the reds and the whites they were ripening but was slower, um, and so the picking kind of started a little bit later in the season. Uh, a lot of them are low, came in early-ish, and um, uh, in 2011 we had, we, there's over 400 acres planted uh, in Napa Valley uh, under under our management, which is brilliant. Um, there's some Merlot in Carneros and um, San Lina and a lot in Yonville, which is where most of our plantings are. And the Merlot is always the blend. Um, there's usually some Cabernet Sauvignon and we have some Petit Verdot, which we can use a lot of different places. It's really wonderful for that. And we also have um, a chunk of Malbec planted in Yonville also. So it gives us a lot of work, a lot of things to work with. Um, the Merlot is also aged in small French oak. Um, and I think it's usually about 40% new uh, barrels in this vintage. And, um, but the, the thing about the 11 vintage in particular, things ripened a little bit differently. They were not as voluptuous, maybe, as some of like the previous vintage, 2010 and 2009, were much riper and more jammy and more forward in those kinds of uh, berry and cherry fruits. And I think that the 11 have a little more of um, kind of a cassis berry or, a, or a, a little bit of more of a leaf quality sometimes to them, which is really probably more traditional because yeah. in the 80s and before. Grapes were considered ripe at 22 and a half, and we're still picking these in 2011 at 24 and a half, but we're getting a different spectrum of aromas and flavors um, than we had in recent vintages. So they're they're more restrained, but and they have a slightly different structure. So um, yeah, I mean, some some people what I've heard was that just starting to taste these uh, around the country when I travel around. Uh, some people say it's a little bit of old world. Yeah. Uh, style. Uh, other people, as you've said, is, is styles that were produced in Napa Valley back in the 70s, maybe early 80s. Yeah. yeah. I, I kind of, there's phenomenal wines, and I taste them. Some people like the 11s over the 10s, some people like the 10s over the 11s. Um, but it's, uh, so they're, they're beautiful wines, but across the board, they're like a point lower in alcohol. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Bonus on that. yeah so Category, you know, typically these would be all mid upper 14s, and these are all under 14. Yep. Uh, which is actually it's very refreshing. Yep. Um, two questions, Stacy. Um, blending strategy, specifically, I mean, sorry, generally, and then specifically to Merlot, what does the Petit Syrah add to the blend? And those are from George Gaber, by the way. The yeah. Gentleman who wrote the Judgment Paris article. Oh. Ah. Um, well, with blending in general, um, we have several different vineyards, and most of them are divided into many different blocks. So as they come into the winery, we have probably 60 or 80 plots at some point, where um, a lot of the fermenters are, are fairly small, actually. We've got fermenters from 4 tons up to 25 tons, our biggest fermenter. Is 25 tons. So, um, and each fermentation usually takes a slightly different course, and, and uh, so a lot of times you can create more mouthfeel or a better structure in wine by obviously blending a few different things together. Um, the Merlot, um, and actually in this vintage, because that in some blends I felt they needed a little more tannin. Uh, we used our Petit Verdot to a really good advantage because that tends to be a little red, darker color and have a stronger 
um, tan profile, and so you can sort of bring the wine down out a little bit further. Um, the Malbec usually contributes a lot of color and sometimes a lot of fatness. Um, the Petite Syrah and the spinach in this Merlot I used because it had color and tan. And we have planted there at the winery stakes as well. And um, I just thought that it added a little something to this wine in the aroma and in the structure that I thought that we needed. Um, but normally speaking, obviously, we want to stick with sort of a classic combination. But um, we also want to make the best wine we can. So in that case, we used what we had at hand. Yeah. So. And I think very effectively, and I think we have a certain kind of an enduring style uh, in our Merlot. Uh, more of a classic uh, style of Merlot. Mer what Merlot, I think, was originally envisioned as uh, over over the many years. And that is a wine almost of a Cabernet style structure. Yeah. So it's not a light, lean, windy Merlot. It's, it's pretty significant and pairs of well, we, well, with Cabernet, I think when people call it a uh, Cabernet uh, drinkers are well. Yeah. Question? Where in the valley is the source from? Uh, Carneros? Um, yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, the, the, sort of the sourcing for the grapes. Well, the sourcing for yeah, All of our own vineyards with the locations. Um, um, we got some Merlot out of Carneros Vineyard, or Carneros Vineyard, um, quite a bit out of the Nantville. Um, Appalachian, and that's also where some of the Petit Verdot and all the Malbec is, and a lot of the Cabernet. And then um, at the winery site, we also have um, a lot of Merlot and Petit Verdot. So, um, yeah, it looks like the, uh, just like some notes here. The, uh, notable portions of the grapes come from our Charles Creek property, Simpson, uh, Page, uh, as well. Uh, we do have a nice website. Really does a nice overview of our vineyards there. So if you're really interested in the, the exact source, and you can take a look at that. Uh, a question for both of you to answer: Do you think that Merlot is is we're in the best of times for Merlot? What is your opinion about the grape variety and its popularity, gaining popularity? Is it gaining popularity? Uh, <clears throat> well, first of all, I think it's a, a great varietal when produced properly, grown in the right places, and we tend to grow ours in uh, a little more clay-based soils. Yeah. Done right, vinified right, which I think Stacey did a great job here. I think it's a great wine. Now, in the marketplace, uh, they travel a fair amount. And, uh, can we go Stacy? She stays in the wine here all the time. Um, it's kind of just Oh, they are neutral. Some places see an uptick. Other places, it's just kind of flat sales, and um, it's not, you know, it's 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 not on fire, but it's not declining either. Uh, and it's still, you know, it's a significant variety out there in the marketplace. Yes, I mean, it's a good as one of those Bordeaux varietals, and as you said, in the right area, I mean, it can make add a lot of structure and a lot of yeah. interest. So I think it's just. For usual, is going to fall down into what people like stylistically, and, and in some cases, where, where the Merlot is coming from. Um, um, ageability, please, to talk about ageability in your Merlot. So many people are asking. Yeah, I'd say yeah. ageability on, on our Merlot here. Uh, you know, five plus, five to ten. Uh, yeah, and it's not that it would fall apart at that point, but yeah. I think most of the common enjoyment and fruit quality uh, would, would be good yeah. for the thing. Yeah, our, our experience with ageability of our wines really is more in vintage select and yeah. family reserve uh, wines. Where we have it's pretty extensive sellers of that. Oh yeah, uh, this, there's a significant uh, note in the 2011. I think uh, everyone has a <coughs> their bottles out there. If you look at the label, it's the 150th anniversary harvest. So 1861 to 2011 is uh, the 150th anniversary. Uh, of course, we celebrated it in 2011. Now we're extending that with the vintages that are now just coming out uh, under 2011. Um, you know, again, oldest winery in Napa Valley, quite, you know, quite a history there, and 
uh, even under my family's ownership since 1943. We're one of the uh, most enduring families of uh, single ownership on a winery in Napa Valley. Um, can you tell the generation? Yeah, gen generation story. <laughs> uh, well, today and over the last oh, 10 years, I think it, it's been, um, I oversee Charles Krug, the blending. I work very, very close, uh, closely with Stacy, especially as we near the final blends. But back in 1991, my brother Mark uh, was overseeing uh, with Charles Krug. Um, and in 1991, a very good friend of his uh, had Cabernet Franc that was being delivered to uh, Duck Horn. Um, Duck Horn, and that was a big vintage actually. And Duck Horn sellers had their tanks full. He had delivered most of his Cabernet Franc there, but he had five tons left in his vineyard to deliver to, to the winery, and they just could not take it. So he called my brother, frantic, call the. It was ready to harvest. Uh, and Mark says, well, I don't know what to do with this stuff. And I'll see if I can call some other wineries to find get a home for you. In the meantime, uh, it turns out our, our Willow Lake Merlot, that tends to be our best Merlot, our Carneros Merlot, our Swinson uh, Cabernet, tends to be our best Cabernet vineyard. Those are both ready to harvest. So my brother Mark uh, thought very briefly about it and uh, called up his friends. He's bringing your five tons of Cab Font tomorrow. And then arranged to have five tons of our Willow Lake Merlot uh, delivered and uh, ten tons of the Swenson Cabernet delivered the next day. So brought it all in, crushed it into one tank, co-fermented it. I think the, the, the fortunate thing, my dad was on a sales trip, I believe, to Southern California. Comes back a couple days later, and as he's always done all his life, walks through the fermentation tanks and sees this one tank in Bordeaux blend. So goes to my brother's office and says, what's this thing here? And then Mark explained, and Dad being much more conservative, much more thoughtful uh, in endeavors like this, uh, just kind of went ballistic. He ostracized Mark for a while, and couldn't believe what he had done, and, you know, the amount of money that was tied into these grapes with no future, uh, at least we thought. And uh, then what we did was uh, went to the fermentations, really fell in love with the wine, barreled it down, uh, turn it a beautiful style. It tends to be more spice driven, uh, cinnamon, cedar notes. Bottled it up, and we bottle it actually in shiners, which means there's no label, no capsule. And if you ever come across a 1991 vintage of our Charles Coop Generations, take a look at the cork when you pop it. Uh, all of our corks are branded. That one was not. All it said was vintage 1991, no Charles Coop reference. We weren't sure if we were going to sell the bottles to another winery to let them figure out what to do with it, or put it under a different label. We had no idea, so bottled it in China, parked in our cellar for a while, and then eventually we said, we had to do something here. So worked on some names, couldn't get come up with anything, and then one of our cellar people, been with this for quite a few, quite a few years, uh, said, call it generations after all the family members that have been involved, um, all the different generations that have been involved with the winery. So love that name, that stuck. Uh, released it in 1996 and have been, been producing it ever since. The original one uh, was co-fermented. We haven't, we don't co-ferment today because we're trying to get all these things optimally ripe at the same time as possible. <laughs> and now we've extended uh, beyond just those uh, three varieties. So. Yeah, so it's been more of a Bordeaux blend um, historically, and in the last two or three years, we've actually. Um, Increase the, the contribution from the Cabernet Sauvignon, so it's a little has a little more structure and uh, and I think a little more length uh, length to it. It's just a different. It's less less wide and more. Yeah, uh, nice so length. so the Cabernet portion is usually in that getting closer to that 85 percent range, and this is, this is 87, I think. But um, but yeah, I think the year before was 77 percent Cabernet. Oh, yeah. And then, year, then <coughs> we're always 50 to 60 percent in the last couple of years. The cabernet is creeping up. Yeah. A question, Stacy, about why no cabernet from in your blend, at least in these wines. Um. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> these are deep questions. 
Oh, um, why no Cabernet Franc in these blends? We do have two, three, we have three sites where there's Cabernet Franc. Um, one of them is just very slow to come on, and sometimes I don't feel that it's all that right. And, and I, in my experience, Cabernet Franc sometimes has more of an herbaceous quality to it, and unless it can get, unless you can get the right amount of stress on it, and it's a really bright beer, sometimes that herbaceousness sort of dominates. And so I, I am kind of picky about where we drop it in, and, and it's true, these three don't happen to have some. I know that some of the wines do have it, but it's, I guess it's not my favorite thing to use. I mean, but not that you're not surprised sometimes that, you know, some lots are, if it fits and it works, we'll put it in, but. Uh, I think it's indicative of the vintage. I mean, that's true. Cooler vintage. They were really Less cool. bright. Uh, so, Cap Trunk didn't quite make it. Right. Uh, just a little bit. On the other hand, Petit Verdot is easy to love. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, I mean, Cap Trunk usually is in, in the generations. Yeah. Um, Malbec is the one that kind of, Rarely you know, shows up on occasions. Yeah, I think our mouth is pretty good though. Yeah. Really good. yeah. So I think we'll we'll be working a little more with that. So a couple of things. Oh, yeah, a couple oh. questions. Um, one is because uh, we can't find this in our details, but the total number of cases for generations 2011, and That's also cool. concrete eggs. Do you use them? So answer the question. Oh, concrete eggs. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I told my dad uh, this is a couple of years ago on concrete eggs. And concrete came in a boat, and he just like rolled his eyes. He he you know he dealt with a lot of concrete uh, tanks uh, <laughs> and the sanitation, and everything else was just an absolute nightmare. Of course, that concrete was totally different than, than what happened. No, I I'm I'm game for trying. No, we do not have concrete eggs as of yet. But but uh, Saudi Arabia would be interested in concrete eggs. Yeah. Our production manager is kind of doctoring up these things. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, let's see. It's, it's probably around 2,000, a little, a little under, no. about 2,000 on their cases, I think. No, well. It's about something like that. It's not, it's not a lot. I think it's like in the teens. Okay, so it's less than Usually, that, I think it, we, we've been creeping. That one has been creeping up over the last two or three, maybe. Right but yeah, the, the 11 might be a little bit smaller because of the vintage. Yeah. I think it's under 2,000 cases. So. I think it's just under, and then the 2012 is, is larger. Yeah. Um, and, and this is nationally distributed as well. I mean, the Merlot and the um, Generations are nationally distributed, so they're a little easier to find. Um, as well. A question, do you think having the wines tick in at a lower alcohol level will, will influence future vintages? So, in other words, a cooler year, did that give you any cues? But Oh, does the vintage 11 being lower alcohol suggest how we should go forward in the future? And I don't think it does because what after the 80s when everything was right at 27, um, I think what everyone is way more involved in now is finding a good brightness for that vineyard, for that block, and in some cases for these rows versus those rows. So. It really has more to do with, for us, with picking the fruit when it actually has good flavor and lacks greenness and, and has good color development and and all those kinds of things are more important than the final alcohol, frankly. Yeah, I mean, what, what I say is <coughs> regarding alcohol, I think alcohol is a byproduct of your efforts. It's not a target point. You don't look for certain alcohols, it's just, it is what it is, but it ends up to be when you're making a certain style. And I think, um, if you look back at the older wines, and we taste our stuff back into the you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, um, all that stuff is 12, 12 and a half percent alcohol. And if you go back to that era, most of the grape wines were um, that leaf roll, yeah. uh, red leaf, so there's a fair amount of virus in those vineyards, and those those grapes struggled to to get ripe. So the sugar wasn't there. They would get um, flavor ripeness. They would get there, but the sugars weren't there because the the, the virus inherent viruses that are prevalent today. There's very little virus in the vineyards 
True. Well, there's, there's, there's well, new viruses there's coming new virus. in. There's yeah, new ones coming in. So. Yeah. No, but no, but and but that's actually a good. Con that's a long conversation with almost anybody because I think nobody really knows for sure why things are different now or why they seem to. I mean, aside from style and and preferences that that are influenced by any number of of tastemakers uh, out there, but. Um, whether it's rootstock issues or spacing issues or age of vines or something or other, but there's something different about the way that the wines mature or the grapes yeah. mature now, and and for a variety of reasons, you find yourself drifting into those 24 and a half, 25 and a half, merely to get to the baseline where you want to start to consider picking in most years, um, and there's all kinds of factors that play into that, and also speaking of Mr. Mandavi. He does still cruise the winery and and call up with notes that he wants some things taken care of or he wants something yeah. done. And he is a big proponent of lower alcohol. Yeah, I have, absolutely. I have he been is. called to his office a number of times to discuss <laughs> alcohol, <laughs> and, and uh, he would much prefer them to be lower. Well, something to said about that because you know this year, this November, we're buying uh, 100, and he, yeah. you know, yes. most of his life he's drinking lower, you know, alcohol, wine, was 12, 12 and a half percent. But no, he, he's this is, he's been on that rampage for. Years ever Long since time. alcohols, and you know, I think rightfully so as well. But I think you know, the vineyards are what they are, and you know, they, they deliver us today sure. as opposed to you know, many years ago. And the generations also, it's one of our reserve tiers, it's 100% in French oak, and um, it's really a barrel selection when we go in to make it. Um, again, we'll have those many lots of, of Cabernet, and also in the vineyards. Um, We've identified a number of flocks in the better vineyards that tend to go into the reserves, and we're focusing more and more on dealing with them in the field. And they come in separately. They come in in the, the 26 pound lug boxes. They go across the sorting belt. Um, they go into the smaller fermenters. And so there's a selection process that actually begins right about now, actually, in the vineyard about which yeah. rows are going to be managed for a reserve program. So it, it's a big commitment. And we're usually trying to um, manage about 100, 120 tons to funnel into the 10 clones and the vintage select and, and the generations and the album. So um, it, it's a very serious endeavor. So your efforts in the, in the vineyard to earmark these rows or, yeah. or blocks, I mean, it's more leaking, it's more crop thinning, it's uh, getting rid of the wings and, yeah, and green thinning. It's so, a lot of yeah, yeah, a lot, lot more TLC that goes into that. But even even when yeah. it goes through all that process, it's not guaranteed those and lots will go in. There's, yeah, there's accidents. You may still cut them. Things, things <laughs> can still go sideways. But, but so for all of these, they are, and we also, I guess for, there's about 12 coopers that we're using with our Bordeaux varieties, and it tends to be a selection of this lot and that barrel goes here, and this lot yeah. and that barrel goes over there. And so there's a lot of very fine work that's going on, um, you know, for some of these smaller lots. So. Any more questions, or yes. you want to? I have more questions. Uh, people are in love with the Howl Mountain. We're going to make them wait for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're teasing everyone out there. We're going to hold yeah. off on the Howl Mountain. Yeah. Um, Plans ever for a 100% petite bear dough and a prognostication for the 2014 vintage from you, Stacey, or Peter, or both? So, whether we would make a 100% petite bear dough, dough, and yeah, I would, but okay. um, I need to work on that a little bit because at the moment they're still coming into Tannis and they, they'd be tougher. At the moment they're a little tough, but it's standalone. But, yeah, but they, I mean, that's, could, that's one of the beauties about them. They're ever so yeah. kind of dark and everything else. They're great for blenders, but yeah, it's a challenge to make it. So it's a possibility. Yeah. I mean, it's a possibility. It's a good, it's a good uh, you know, it's a consideration. I think. True. Uh, but nothing, there's nothing in the plan at this point. I think if you came across, uh, you know, if you got your a couple lots in and you just start jumping up and down about it, some lots that are standalone, then that's yeah. when you start looking at it. Yeah, true. And and so, so like like this one, they probably you know would could go through the, the vehicle of the tasting room only. Yeah, that'd be a tasting room only uh, type wine. Yeah, yeah. I think this is it. And 2014. 2014. 
All right. So far, so good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's weird though. Um, okay. We're in a dry year. There was very little rain this winter, and um, there was like two rain events, like in the last several months, that yeah, sort of happened right. at a good opportune time. Um, but given that the whole winter was dry, we started irrigating um, in January, right before the vines were starting to push because they needed a certain amount of water in the root zone to do their thing. Um, but the vines remarkably look pretty healthy, you know, despite the fact that they did not have a lot of lot of uh, lot of water yeah. in the root zone. Um, the Sabian block cracks me up because it's right out the front door of the winery and, and it's just everywhere. <laughs> it's growing um, like crazy. <laughs> and um, and actually everything's moving pretty quickly in the vineyard. I think we're like two maybe two weeks ahead of okay. normal. Um, there's a lot of work in the vineyard right now because it's just been happening so quickly. Um, they're we're even behind in terms of removing laterals and opening up the canopy. Everything's pretty much set by now, which is, you know, it's a little on the early side. Um, um, but it looks like another fairly large vintage again. Um, a bunch of counts are there. A bunch of counts are high-ish, and, uh, but we haven't really gone through and kind of done the, the basic sorting out that we, that we normally have done, but it looks early. Um, we did not have frost. Um, there's rumors that it's supposed to be a hotter than average summer, which could be difficult given that you know there's not a lot of uh, water to yeah. you know, manage stress. We have wells, not on wood. That yeah, we're 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 in fine shape on water, but the watering regime may be a little different because I don't think the the water profiles in the soil uh, are clearly depleted. I mean, the grapevines are happy today, but as we get towards yeah. harvest, year, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I think the the irrigation regime this year could be in sort of small, short, you know, spurts of water, it could be some very longer, deeper, more penetrating uh, irrigation regimes, but yeah. we'll see. Yeah. So it's early to tell. Yeah, I mean, it, it's looking great so far, but yeah. this water profile on the soil could throw us a True. curveball. And the nat natural water restriction that is there could, same as last words, lead to small, the clusters are huge, actually, by the way. They're, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> um, but um, but the berries could be smaller in size, which you frequently you're trying to do on purpose anyway in terms of the water management. So that may just simply happen naturally. And um, you know, I guess on the plus side, if things ripen more quickly, who doesn't like to finish up before like November? Yeah. So you know, um, but it looks pretty good. Yeah, so far so good. But you know, there's a lot of Every time to transpire before now. Harvest. And the last couple of years have been so dramatically different from one another, and, and I've been in the business one and very long a long period of time. And <laughs> just the last several years, even together, are just so wildly this way or that way. It's just, it's, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. Okay, we've got 12 minutes, and there's another bunch of questions coming in. You may want to really get technical. Um, and again, please repeat. I appreciate it. Um, people are saying, do you, do you, and I'm sorry if I didn't catch this, but there's a debate about whole cluster petite for dough, like whole cluster cluster fermenting. Petite to raw or petite for dough? For dough. Yeah. yeah, so are you doing yeah. that? Probably. No. Can you mention this? Oh, oh, several do, people talking about do, it. do we do whole cluster petite for dough? No. <laughs> I don't think we do any whole cluster. Yep. Say 20% will work. Try it. That's from UC though. And several people have volunteered to punch down for you. Oh, there you go. It's a barrel thing. There you go. And, um, several bloggers have done that. So. Okay, next one is: um, uh, Is there a medium plus toast on the generations in Howl Mountain 2011? Yes. Um, uh, it's uh, the barrel toast level on the the generations in the Howl Mountain. Um, is there a medium plus? And, Everything I order, I order a large percent of medium plus, and then it's probably it's maybe two thirds medium, well, two thirds medium plus, and the rest is heavy toast. And but the selection varies because certain certain Cooper's barrels at medium plus are spot on, and other people need to be heavy toast to kind of be in the same range. So it's it's, it's very touchy feely, and I don't even bother trying to figure it out. I just let them make their toast levels and. Then we just select the ones that work the barrels 
because they work in the blend. Um, but uh, yeah, everything is at least in the new blend. Okay. Um, did you talk about the barrel program for the reserve versus non? The reserve is 100% French oak. Uh, we are using about seven or eight coopers like Fossilway and Ben Martin and a lot of Terrence, so I love Terrence, so um, Fossilway actually. Um, we have some Hermitage barrels that are that always work as well with the reserves. So, and I've been keeping notes so I can you can kind of see where which ones tend to get selected. So, um, but I think we've kind of boiled it down to that yeah. stable of, of seven or eight or nine coopers that that work with the one style, to our understanding of it. And then uh, versus our other portfolio, yeah. we had a combination of. French, there are some American oaks. In 2011, certain yeah. And then the other ones don't have 100% new oak. They're 30, 40% 30, 40% new oak. New oak in the, in the Yonkville know, Cabernet and the Merlot. Um, the, the, and the Pinot is, uh, we have Mega Kringer's Pinot that's about 30, 40% new oak. Yeah. Um, Elevation for your Hell Mountain property. So shall we move on to the Hell Mountain yeah. uh, Cabernet? Let's so move moving on to the Hell Mountain Cabernet, let me just give a brief little background because this is our inaugural vintage uh, from this property. This property we bought back in early 2000. It was actually a uh, almost 60 acres of just strictly forested area. Uh, it's the very end of Cold Springs. So if you go up to Hell Mountain, find Cold Springs is sort of the very end, the dead end. And take a little bit of a right turn, and that's that's where this vineyard is. But it's all forest. Managed to scratch out a little over 23 acres because of restrictions on coverage with forests, and you can't develop anything over 5% grade. So that's that's where we're able to scratch out out of, out of about 60 acres, about 23 acres, give or take. Uh, all Cabernet. It's a fun little strip of Pinot, Pinot uh, in there. Uh, the um, uh, Vineyards were planted in 2007 after extensive uh, work up there. Uh, rolling, very rolling hills. There's no, what's nice about it, there's no bowls in there. Everything drains well from a frost standpoint. So frost is really not an issue. There are some parts that are kind of like bowls up there and they are frost traps. Uh, this one's not, like one knoll is like red, the other knoll is like white. Yeah, a lot of so significant, uh, significant uh, soil variations up there. So it's a fun, fun place that we're just uh, learning about, and yeah, a lot of different exposures up there. Uh, and so this is starting to get into our programs, and this is our first um, you know, Hell Mountain. This is actually this Hell Mountain here is actually kind of a counterpart to Generations and to our Vintage Select Cabernet, which we don't have here today. The counterpart to that. And that will let you. And actually, the, the yeah. and this, 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 I think, is one of our most exciting vineyard parcels um, because I do think that there is a huge amount of there there in terms of how long. Um, did you mention the elevation? Oh, well, elevation, I think it's about 1,600, I think it's about 1,600 feet uh, up there. Yeah. And, and the cool thing about how mountain is that it's frequently above the fog layer. So so on summer days when it, the, the St. Helena and particularly in Yonka, the fog will linger. Um, how mountain will warm up earlier in the day, but it tends to cool down a little bit more at night because being up on the hillside, the breezes start up and it tends yeah. to cool down. So it sort of has this slightly inverse relationship to the bottom part of the valley. And then how mountain itself too has being on the hillside, there's a lot of different little pockets and areas, and again, the, the, the soil variation is huge. Yeah, the exposure and soils are yeah, just dramatic. Um, but out of Hell Mountain, um, in particular, we have our Cold Spring Vineyard. Um, we're making a very small production um, in our limited release portfolio that, that is tasting room only. That is vineyard designated Cold Spring, so it's 100% from that vineyard. It's cab with a little bit of tea for dough. But with uh, the next tier down, this family reserve, it's something that we can work a little bit more with blending and and also just with the grape handling with the fermentation to take that take the very tannic profile <coughs> that is that Hellman is known for, 
make that more of a signature in the smaller um, limited release wine, but then try to look at making this a little broader and a little more easily approachable um, and create some differentiation between the two bottlings. Um, but I'm thinking that in general, this family release uh, or family reserve would could have, and in this case, this has a percent and a half of Malbec in it, um, and it has a little petit verdot from, from Cold Springs, but there's a potential to work a little more low or work a little uh, little more Malbec into the blend and try to create a broader um, impression in the, in the smell. Yeah, <coughs> I think, imagine this one will be nationally distributed. Small production, about 500 cases on this In the spinach, yeah. On the first spinach. Uh, primarily it'll be in restaurants and, uh, and some fine wine stores uh, as well uh, on the distribution of this one. And it'll be, we're going to start shipping, I think, in the next uh, couple weeks, right around June 1st, I think we're starting to ship it in the market. Uh, Peter, two questions for you. What is the best seller among these four, and can you speak to the different color bands on the line? Uh, best seller just from a outright volume standpoint. <clears throat> it would be uh, the Merlot. Um, and then the bands we have uh, in our family reserve and limited release programs, we've, we've uh, drawn off the stripe, the red stripe of vintage select Cabernet. Now, the vintage select Cabernet, the first vintage for that one was 1944. It had vintage selection uh, in a, uh, on a diagonal uh, right along here, no stripe or anything. Then in the mid, late 50s, early 60s, it, a, a red stripe is laid over the words vintage selection in there. So that's where the red stripe comes in. And we've kind of carried that theme uh, of that diagonal stripe uh, in our family reserve and limited release wine. So generations was the next one. So instead of red, we had a kind of, a, not black, but very dark uh, gray, charcoal gray there. Um, and then on the uh, literally Sauvignon Blanc, kind of a green one representing more white wine. Uh, then here on the Hall Mountain one, it's uh, kind of a deeper uh, maroon, kind of purple notes to differentiate again from generations and our vintage select uh, Cabernet. So it's a very uh, historical, traditional thing we've done with this category of our wines. Um. Maybe just to talk to you about your perception of mountain fruit versus valley fruit in wine making. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I think you're fine. So you've had some experience with mountain fruit. Yeah. In your past. Yeah. Um, yeah, I worked for, for a very long time for Pine Ridge Winery, and, and like Charles Krug, incidentally, they had a lot of different appellations. And bizarrely, at least two in Carneros and in Town Mountain. Pine Ridge and Charles Krug share a fence <laughs> line, yes. so it was it was an easy choice to uh, to make the make a transition into Charles Krug, um, in terms of just familiarity with, with where the grapes are being grown, um, but the Howe Mountain in particular just has a different tannin, tannin background and it's got um, it's not it's it's sort of an herbaceousness but not in a green way that you would think of it. It's more of there's a there's a dry, brown, tobacco -y, herby uh, quality to it. And the, um, the Cabernet in Yonville tend to be much softer and more supple and um, have a lot of uh, red fruit and a lot of uh, boysenberry, blackberry, and um, more of the traditional fruits that you, that you tend to think of. Um, but it, I guess it really, a lot of the appellation is in Napa that are significant, a lot of it seems to be tannin structure a lot yeah. of times, you know, the way that they really fit in the mouth. Because aroma wise, you know, you could there there are some differences, but I think sometimes it really boils down to, to the way that they fit in the mouth. Yeah. And it's leaf in particular has a unique uh, very supple structure just naturally and, and I think that's also by virtue of the way it pertains fog and the various temperatures that occur during the growing season. So um, I guess for red in particular, you know, how you can develop the, the color and the tan and skin and how you can get that exposure and, and how they heat up and, and that sort of thing seems to really translate a lot of times into the wine. So, closing thoughts, do you have a minute? Closing thoughts? Mm -hmm. um, 
love to hear from everyone over time about uh, the 2011 vintage because we and Stacy found it very challenging, but I think it's uh, been very successful, though, yeah. and uh, with the minds we have here. And you have to visit because we recently uh, completed a multi million dollar renovation of Charles Creek Historical 1981 Winery. And um, so it's now a multi level hospitality center yeah. and it's just gorgeous. Yeah, it's actually a center, 18, 18, oh, sorry, yeah, 18, 18, 1872 18. was when the Redwood Cellar was built. 1881 oh. was the carriage house. Never mind. So, that's okay. That's after the wooden <laughs> one burned down. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, so, uh, no, it's fantastic to stop by and see this new space. Yeah, yeah, and there's a lot of wines that are not nationally distributed, so, and uh, the, the quality of your experience, I think, would be extraordinary. Yes. Well, thank you for the, for the hour. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night.